بارك الله فيك دكتور يحيى آه طبعا هنحكيكم شوية على على المؤتمر وعملية التنظيم بتاعه نحن في كل جامعة بنغازي مع التخصصات المختلفة سواء في الهندسة الكهربائية وهندسة الاتصالات وتقنية المعلومات فكرنا قلنا المفروض نحن البحاث والدارسين جميع الدكاترة والبحاث في عامة في التخصصات هذه في بنغازي ان نحن نشتغل مع بعضنا ونهتم ببعضنا نديروا كونه فريق واحد فريق هذا يكون بقوة كبيرة يقدر يدير يتفاعل ويتمكن منه حقيقة يحل أي مشاكل موجودة في العلوم الصلاحة اللي عندنا في سواء في العلوم تقنية المعلومات في العلوم الكهرباء والمشاكل اللي احنا نشوفون كلها فرأينا إن تجتمع المؤسسات التعليمية المختلفة فاجتمعت كلية تقنية المعلومات وكلية الهندسة بجامعة بنغازي وكلية تقنية المعلومات بالجامعة الدولية زي ما كنا نشوفه وكلية التقنية الكهربائية والإلكترونية واجتمعت معنا هي تبحث العلوم الطبيعية والتكنولوجيا شركة تطوير وتلقينا مع بعضنا، تلقينا بعضنا في فكرة إن المفروض العلم بصفة عامة المفروض يكون في يعني هذول خبرات كبيرة موجودة في مكان واحد لكن حقيقة عمرهم ما اشتغلوا مع بعضنا وعمرهم ما تلاقوا بعضهم وفي حتى ممكن احنا هذول ودينا نتعارف على بعضنا. ف فكان الاهداف زي ما احنا باين ان هو ان لازم نخلق في تعاون هو اصلا ما فيش يعني جميع الاعمال العلميه والبحاث العلميه اللي ممكن تشوفون تلقى التعاون حقيقه مش في نفس المدينه او في نفس الجامعه هو تلقى دول مختلفه كل المشتركات في نفس العمل ف فهنا فاجتمعنا بعضنا قلنا قررنا لازم يكون في خلق في تعاون وتبادل العلوم مع بعض لازم يكون في الرابط عن طريق الخاص مع شركه تطوير والشركات الثانيه انه يكون حتى علاقه بين الابحاث اللي احنا نديروا فيه وبين المشاكل اللي اصلا موجوده في الفواجه في البلاد يعني ليبيا سواء مشاكل الصلاة الشوفيه ومشاكل الكهرباء ومشاكل الاخرى ونحاول بعضنا ان نجدوا نجدوا حلول في للاشياء هذه سامحوني ان لازم نحكي نغير في اللغه لان في معنا واحدين انجليز Uh, so I welcome everyone here to uh, joining us in the International Conference for Electrical Engineering and Information Technology in the second round here at the University of Benghazi. Uh, the uh, conference is organized by the University of Benghazi, the Libyan uh, International University, College of Electrical Engineering, that we are company, and uh, and they uh, sorry so we we gathered uh, all together here for we gather our forces our strength our work together to be able to uh, join and collaborate and create research together this research is its aims to solve all uh, the problems that we are facing here create collaboration between the different uh, aspects of different uh, engineering and information technology uh, researchers Uh, we thought this is the, the best way to start this collaboration is by a conference or by creating a conference. Through this conference, everyone can be together, like all the staff members from the different faculties, different colleges, they can be together. And then uh, to produce, through this collaboration, then can invest for, for more collaboration later. المؤتمر كنا من اهم اهداف احنا قلنا خلاص اول اول احسن طريقه ان مش نقدر نحرف في بعضنا نقدر نتعارفوا ان نديروا المؤتمر هذا هذا المؤتمر طبعا الدوره الثانيه تاع المؤتمر الاول كان في ممكن حتى شويه بعد شويه كان في الجامعه الليبيه الدوليه اهداف المؤتمر اول حاجه ان احنا نكون مؤتمرات علميه هندسيه او تقنيه معلومات يكون ضمن بالمعايير المتبعه عالميا ويكون الابحاث اللي فيه كلها منشوره في سكوبس طبعا ليش ال شنو هي سكوبس؟ نحن ديما نحكي سكوبس وممكن في مجموعه ما ما عندهاش علم سكوبس هي عباره عن قاعده بيانات كبيره، قاعده بيانات هذه فيها جميع البحوث والملخصات العلميه، طبعا العلميه في كل العلوم سواء الادبيه سواء الهندسيه سواء الطبيه، لكن القاعده بيانات هذه ما تخشلاش الا المجلات المحكمه واللي مختاره من قبل مختصين في في هذا المجال. فبمعنى شنو؟ بمعنى ان اذا كانك انت جيت نشرت في سكوبس معناها انت البحث بتاعك كانك اخذت الجوده في ان البحث حقيقي وبحث ممتاز وبحث يرقى انه يكون من الابحاث الممتاز وفي نفس الوقت هو السكوبس هذا هو النشر فيه يساعد الجامعات فدائما نضيف على الجامعه بغازي والجامعات الاخرى دائما يحاول يدعم ويشجع نحو انك انت لازم تشجع سكوبس لانه هو يساعد في دعم الجامعه في انها ترقى في التصنيفات المختلفه So, uh, one of the, so the, one of the goals of the, of the governing or this forum that was created together from the five different organizations was to collaborate and to integrate each other. And we found we thought the best way to do that is through the best way to do that is through creating uh, starting a conference. And, with, and this one is the second one. One of the aims of the conference was 
is to uh, one of the conference, uh, conference is to uh, publish all uh, all the all the uh, work here that's created by the uh, by the researchers joining all in the Scobas Index uh, uh, publications. The, why why Scobas? Scobas is because of its. Uh, because is a data uh, center where all papers that are uh, bare viewed and they are like well knowing all set together and by publishing in scope that means that your paper is in high quality standard paper and helps all universities to rank up in, at the universities and go up in the ranking and here i want to and i have been had been barik li jamat ghazi jamati in adkhul ha li al qs al tariq al albahath li kan bahatha li kana kina zi ma kina tam min scopus wa tam min saada fi akil and here i would like to uh, congratulate my university university of ghazi for joining the qs this year uh, as goes around the, of, of all the research and space that been receiving through its well uh, written papers and published papers So, if the data is present, we are from from the combination of the five or six of each one. So, in the data, the companies will come from the data that is useful for the research. From the data, we are always dependent on some of each other. It is not a problem. It is a problem that is occurring. The problem is that the data that is in the lab, the universities, the colleges, they are looking for a solution. The solution is that they produce the product, they use the company, and they get the profit from it. And another problem is that the data is always in a circular pattern that is moving around. وهذا هو كان الهدف اللي احنا نحاولوا نخلقوه هنا في 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 غزه ممكن ان شاء الله تحقق دائره اكبر يعني مستوى ليبيا يعني فهي الشركه شو حيقدر حيقدر حلول لمشاكل قائمه وفي نفس الوقت في افكار جديده ينتجها الافكار الجديده هذا سوق جديد ينفتح احنا لما نشوف احنا له سوق الاتصالات هذا البدايه بقينا عباره عن مكالمه بعدين قعد مكالمه ومسجات بعدين قعد مكالمه وانترنت وبعدين خش عليه الالعاب وخش عليه الستريمنج وخش عليه هذا كله سوق كبار بكل بعد ما كان هو عباره عن مكالمه صوتيه كبار السوق وكبار السوق ايش معناها؟ معناها في يمكن يخرج رجال اموال منها وشيء هذين هذه كلها نجر عليه ايش؟ نجر على افكار طبعا اصلا من الاكاديميه وفي نفس الوقت بالنسبه للمؤسسات التعليميه يهمها فظاهر في انها تشجع المؤتمرات هذه في انها تشجع الطلبه وعضاء ادريس على النشر وعلى البحث وعلى الاستمراريه في عمليه البحث العلمي وتكون المالتي ديسبلين او يعني مجموعات علميه ومجموعات بحثيه من مختلف المجالات ما تكونش مجال واحد سواء اتصالات بس او تاخذ معلومات بس يكون الشراكة مع بعضهم في نفس الوقت قلنا يعزز من مكانه الجامعه. Uh, the aims of this collaboration that we're having through these five organizations is For, for, for companies and is to create here this, this culture of the companies trying to find solutions through the institutions that we have here, all the education institutions. And those of you these education institutions, you'll find solutions for the ones they have. These solutions and then can be changed to patents and then sold uh, and, and used for solving all these motions. And also through these research, the market can actually grow and get bigger and bigger with all these new ideas that we, we are creating. Through the university, however, uh, it will be it's, it's a, like the university wants the conferences and all and the benefits that gets from conferences is it uh, encourages students, researchers, and everyone for to continue their research, publish their work, and show their work, and also create all these multidiscipline projects. Through now we have like through this uh, uh, conference, previous conference and this conference and these collaborations, we have uh, we can see here you can see later we have papers that are done by mechanical engineers with the help of electrical engineers, and we have another ones with communication engineers and IT engineers. All this collaboration that's created. Now, because of, our, because, because of this collaboration, it's, it's, it's one of the important things that uh, you know, the university wants, and also it helps us to uh, reduce the distance between the university and the, and, and the companies, and also increase the uh, ranking of the university. So, the Canada, of course, the first. الاجتماع لنا او اول تجربه لنا كانت المؤتمر الدولي الاول الهندسه الكهربائيه وطاقه المعلومات واللي تبناتها في الجامعه الليبيه الدوليه برئاسه السيد الدكتور توفيق الطويل والحمد لله ان المؤتمر لقى نجاح كبير وتمكنا من نشر في السنه المؤتمر اللي فات 50 ورقه علميه الميزه اللي كانت احنا بنحاول نحافظوا عليها ان شاء الله تمكنا بها في المؤتمر الاول وتوا حتى المؤتمر الثاني ان جميع الاوراق العلميه نشرا تم في الميسكوبس وفي المؤتمر الاول والثاني وما تمش وتم تقييد الدفعه تكلفه بتاع بالكامل من قبل قبل المؤتمر في السنه اللي فاتت كان شركه تطوير غطت جميع تكاليف النشر 
للورقه العلميه فالكتاب اعطتهم فرصه او خصوصا الشباب الصغار والطلبه وهذول بالذات مع الوضع اللي قاعدين فيه الوضع المالي تو اعطتهم فرصه أن يعرضوا اوراقهم العلميه في سكوبس في مجلات في محترم عالميه من غير ما يحتاجوا الى دفع مبالغ طائله هم ما, ما يقدروش عليها فشكرا لشكر كبير السنه اللي فاتت والسنه هذه نحن لما كنا عن طريق منظمه اجيا زي ما حكي شو فهذا هي صوره كانت بسيطه خاصه حتى متحركين من ماليزيا فكان المؤتمر لقى نجاح كبير شجعنا ان نحن نخشوا على الدور الثاني يكون ان شاء الله حيكون هو سنوي كل سنه حيكون في الدور الثالثه والرابعه نشوفيه ان شاء الله فنجو نحن للمؤتمر بتاع السنه هذا هي اللي هو اي سي اي تي 2021 نحن طبعا زي ما قلنا كان الجزء او جزء كبير من الهدف بتاعنا هو حقيقه تشجيع العمليه البحثيه وتشجيع البحث العلمي تشجيع طلبتنا تشجيع اعضاء الرئيس تاعنا ومحاوله إن مساعدتهم في إن في نشر اوراقهم العلميه وبحثهم العلميه القيمه اللي ما قدروش ينشروها ممكن او نظرا للنقص في التمويل طبعا ممكن يعني الدكاتره هنا عبد الرئيس وهم عارفين انه مكلفه يوصل عند 170 دولار 200 دولار وطبعا ما يقدروش عليه تكلفتهم الطلبه فتمكنا الحمد لله السنه هذه من ضمت لنا اجيا وزاره التعليم الالمانيه ضموا لنا في ان كان واحد رعاه بتاعنا وغطوا جميع التكلفه بتاع النشر العلمي. سو از از تولد بيفور اور اور كونفرنس ايم وذيس اكشلي فورم اوف ذا فايف بارتنرز اور مين ايم is to help publishers, uh, our students, our researchers to publish their work despite the, the hardships they find, the, 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 the lack of funding and, and the lack of money, uh, finance in general. So thanks, thankful, uh, thankfully, or thanks to AGIA, with the help of the Federal Ministry of Education Research, they, uh, they funded the publications for, for all the papers here, and we, they funded about like 59 accepted papers for to be published uh, without any fees for the authors. بعد هذا هي على طول نحن اول ما حصلنا على الفند عرفنا احنا خلاص نقدروا نقدروا ندير البيبرز تم تشكيل جميع الستيرنج كوميتي فبرئاسه ومعانا الدكتور استاذ الدكتور توفيق طويل استاذ الدكتور عبد السلام معتوب الدكتور علي الجيار وتم تشكيل اللجنه العلميه برئاسه الدكتور كينز بوزيد ومعنا الكور شيرز طبعا احنا نحب نقدم شكر خاص للاستاذ الدكتور شادي جوارنا من جامعه جوردن يونيفرستي اوف ساينس اند تكنولوجي لانه كان هو مساهم كبير جدا وساعدنا بشكل كبير ممكن في نشر الاوراق بتاعتنا سواء في المؤتمر اللي فات في سكوبس سواء المؤتمر الظاهر يعني اللي لاهم معنا المساعد الدكتور عبد السلام ما كناش نحن كنا نقدر ننشرهم فشكرا خاص جدا هو قاعد معنا تو تقريبا يسمع فينا. سو انا وذا طبعا الادرس اللي عند مصلح سلامه هاني قال فرحان دكتور فرحان الشيطاني فكثر كلهم اجتمعوا واشتغلنا مع بعضنا سو ذا كونفرنس افتر بينج ايبل تو فاند فور ذا بابليكيشنز وي ستارتد لايك ذا كونفرنس وذ ذا هيلب اوف ذا كونفرنس بروشيرز بروفيسور توفيق طويل بروفيسور عبد السلام معتوب Dr. Ali Shayar, and also with the technical background activity led by uh, Dr. Kent Buzaid and also the help of uh, Mr. Zakaria Jabba Zakaria Faturi. And here I would like to give a, a special thanks to Professor Shahid Jawarna from the Jordan University of Science and Technology, who is our main contact, or who's, uh, through him we managed to, uh, to, to publish all our proceedings from the past conference and from this conference in a Scobus and Text uh, papers. So uh, give a like, special thanks here for that. طبعا بعدها هي اللي عاد افتتحنا نحن السبمشنز بتاع قبول الورقات وكان يعني القبول كان عدد القبول اللي جانا تقريبا 110 ورقه علميه طبعا لما يجي العدد الكبير هذا راح تفرح وفي نفس الوقت تخاف لان كيف تدير عدد الريفيو وكيف تحاول تكون فير في الريفيو ف اضطرينا او او يعني الحمد لله اللي سهل علينا العمليه ان خشوا على 92 باحث من مختلف من مختلف ليبيا ومن خارج ليبيا سواء من الدول العربيه المختلفه الاردن والجزائر سواء حتى من بريطانيا خشوا معنا ف 92 باحث ما بعرفش معنا في عمليه تحكيم الاوراق العلميه فطبعا نحن ما نقدروش نمرهم الواحد هم هناهم لكن نقول هذا الشكر لهم كلهم لو لاهم نحن ما كناش نقدروا ان نختاروا من الاوراق العلميه اللي كنا نختارها سو افتر اميديتلي افتر وي ستارتد لايك وي اوبن فور Submit submission of the papers, uh, because, uh, and then you had to extend for a month because of all the people who wanted to submit their papers to our conference. Then 
But so this war, we end up having like how about 110 babies. This is a lot of war. There's a lot of babies. We only we only wanted like 50 of them at the start. However, with the help of 92 reviewers from all over uh, uh, Libya and also the Arab and also the Europe, uh, with their help, uh, that, you know, and we would like, like to give them like all like a special thanks for their help. That's uh, that we managed to choose uh, 59 babies out of the 100 uh, babies. So if you see here, we are the number of 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 the فنتج عليه ان احنا يعني كان يعني كان صعب جدا عمليه الاختيار كيف تختار احسن 60 من ال 110 حقيقه لان كان كل الابحاث ممتازه ويعني يعني كان عمليه العمليه الاختيار حقيقه صعبه جدا جدا لعل ما في الاخير اخترنا الافضل 60 فتقدروا تشوفوا النسب هنا هي طبعا نسبه القبول كانت 54% من الاوراق العلميه تم قبولهم ومن الحاجات اللي فرحانا ان كان في عندنا مشاركين من بريطانيا زي ما تشوفوا من تايلاند من السعوديه من المغرب ومن الجزائر ومن الاردن فهذا طبعا احنا هو جزء من العمليه هو انترناشونال كونفرنس هو جزء من احنا بندخل كولابوريشن بدايه في المؤتمر الاول كان همنا غير ان احنا ناخذ مع بعضنا بس ناخذ بعضنا جماعه الغاز يعني ممكن في ليبيا وبعدين ونشوف شويه نبدا نكبر ان حتى حقيقه نقدر نحصلوا في قبولات من اوراق علميه من الخارج فالحمد لله يمكن آه تشوفوا هنا بدل تو يبدا عندنا الاوراق العلميه يجن وينتشر عندنا هنا في مؤتمرنا. So uh, we received about like 110 papers with the help of all those 92 reviewers. We met, we uh, we accepted about 60 of, of those papers, which is uh, around 54% uh, acceptance rate. Uh, like we are we were like impressed by the quality of the research, the quality of the papers we received. We received like a very good papers. It was very hard to choose from those 110, 60 papers only to to so publish. However, we were. Uh, uh, we only had the funding for all cities. Only uh, we actually had funding for only 50. However, uh, Agia was very generous with us, and they gave us an ex a funding for extra 10 10 papers uh, to so to get all the 60. However, like all the applications were good, and hopefully uh, the, the girls that we couldn't accept this year, they can submit next year for uh, for, for the conference. And also, we were like very glad to see that we had papers uh, submitted from United Kingdom, from Thailand, from Saudi Arabia, from Morocco, from Jordan, and also from Algeria. Uh, طبعا بعد ما عاد خلاص عاد طلع النتائج واستلمنا الاوراق استلمت عاد عندنا اللجنه التحضيريه برئاسه الاستاذ ساري الطلحي uh, فجاءه يعني احنا الـ 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 الهدف الاساسي راهو من الـ من الـ من المؤتمر مش نحن ما ننساش ديما راهو ديما الواحد لازم يراجع روحه ويشوف شنو الهدف اللي بدا به اصلا لان الهدف كان ان خلق تعاون بين المؤسسات خلق تعاون بين الميات خلق فرق ان لازم يكون الشغل كله فرق مجموعه تخدم بعضها وتشوف هذا فهي خلق فكره التيم وورك هذا هي خلق فالفريق اللي خدم برئاسه السيده هو اللي دار فاسيليتيتنج او هو اللي شغل اللي تشوف فيها كلها يعني عمليه النظام صارت الانترنت موجوده ممكن تشوفوا بعدين باقي المؤتمر كيف نظم الطباعه الملفات الاشياء هذه كلهم طبعا رئيس المؤتمر حقيقي شيء جميل كل جن جهزات وكنورتات يعني يعني داروا شغل غير عادي شغل ممتاز بك برئاسه الساريه وبجمع مجموعة كلها قاعدة هنا غفران وامينة وخليل وسلمين وتوفيق وصلاح وامينة واميرة رمضان ويوسف وصلاح ومحمد حويتي وعبد الكريم وغيرهم راهو نحن من الجنود الاخرى المجهولة فكان كان الشغل امس كيف روحنا ب الليل وهم اصلا اسبوع عسكريين هنا طبعا بنقدم شكر خاص جدا لكلية العلوم اللي استضيفتنا ومتحملتنا وتوفرتنا هذين نحن فتحوا لنا البيبان وقالوا لنا كم المكان فشكر خاص لكلية العلوم اللي 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 يعني اعطونا المكان هذا اللي قاعدين فيه تو فراهو الشغل ما هو شغل شخص او شغل اثنين او ثلاثه او اربعه حقيقه الشغل مجموعه كبيره ابداها انت من فكره الحمد خمس مؤسسات اللي كنا خدمة مع بعضهم ومعها طبعا الجيش اللي قاعد يخدم في هذا المؤتمر من ريفيورز من تي بي سي ممبرز من لجان علميه من لجان تحضيريه فهو من الشغل كان يعني مجهود كبير وفريق كبير جدا يعني. طبعا هذاهي سو اجين سوري ذا ورك از ذا اورجنيشن كوميتي ستارتد وركينج اون ذا اون ذا كونفرنس اتس ذا مين ذا مين ذا مين ذا ايديا بيهايند ذا كونفرنس وبيهايند ذا دوس اورجنيشنز ميتينج توجذر از 
creating yeah. collaboration or creating the team atmosphere, team culture between uh, uh, here in, in uh, between those uh, institutions. And with with the Gracia Committee led by Ms. Saria Talhi and all the members of Ran, Amira, Khalil, Samin, Tawfiq, Salah, Amina, Amir, Ramadan, Yusuf, Salah, Muhammad, and also uh, Abdul Hakim, they all work together to manage to get all the conference running. They've been here camping here for uh, more than a week. Uh, and also all other work that's been done before. And thank you to all of them for all the hard work they put here. And also I want to give a special thanks to the uh, <laughs> the science uh, faculty, uh, science faculty for all their work. And also especially of course here, like all the work here is also I wasn't going to be able to do without all the help of all these funders. We have Shakir Salat Duri and the Libya Salat Tahmiya and the Yaros and the Libyan Hat Mahul, Badar Shit, Shark in the Beer Salat Manuata Kabila, to the man or Fanak, or Shark to connect, and all kill them, no la how much I'm going to do a shit alive, a shock kill them, so there's no kill them. طبعا نحن خلينا نوصل لنهايه نهايه الديشن تاعي سمح لي كان طالت عليكم شويه نحن من, 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 من الاشياء الجميله في المؤتمر هو الكينوت سبيكرز اللي نحن حصلنا عليهم آه عندنا البروفيسور اوليفر كون فروم من اوفنبرغ يونيفرستي عندنا محمد حفيظ من ابصال يونيفرستي وعندنا ابو صالحه من دبيت اريكتر وداد حيعطوا محاضراتهم آه عندنا اليوم محاضرتين وعندنا محاضره غدا تاع صالحه آه تنعطي فرصه تقريبا الدكتور علي هنا تو يعرف عليهم ويحكي شكرا جزيلا جميعا بارك الله فيك السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته يسعدني اليوم اني نقدم الكينوت سبيكرز اللي حيحضروا معنا اليوم ويوم غدا هنقدم الاول جلسه هتكون الكينو سبيكرز بروفيسور اوليفر كون اوليفر كون از بروفيسور ات اوفنبرغ يونيفرستي اوف ابلايد ساينس فروم جيرماني اند ا ممبر اوف ذا عرب جيرمان يانج اكاديمي اوف ساينس اند هيومانيتس اجيا سبيشاليز ان كمبيوتر ساينس افكتيف كمبيوتينج اسيستيف تكنولوجي جيمينج اند جيميفيكيشن هيز اوفر اول فيجن از تو انريتش our environment by initiative interference, uh, intelligent assistive system and uh, motivation games, uh, which adapt to use uh, to the users and the contest. Uh, he pursued these aims at Ovenberg University as a full professor of human computer interaction. He's also the director of uh, ACI and the founder and the director of the software company is called Corion. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Oliver. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Well, it's good. Uh, I would also um, um, start my video if somebody allows me to, because right now the moderator says uh, I can't start my video. But um, let's see if this works. Here, yes. So this is me. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. I would have liked even more uh, to be there in person because I think uh, keynotes become much more interesting if you can interact a little bit. But um, yeah, let's do it like this. So everything technologically, every, everything works fine now. Uh, so yeah, I would... Yeah, we yes, yeah. we can see you. Yeah, you can see me, but you cannot yeah, see my can... presentation yet. Uh, so now I will start and share my presentation. One moment. So. Okay. So now you should see my presentation. that correct? Yeah, not yet. Yeah, we can see it now. Perfect. So, clear. yeah, so thank you once, uh, once again for having me uh, have this uh, keynote. Um, unfortunately, I don't speak Arabic, so uh, you, you have to uh, 
put up with my with my English, and um, but I'm I'm try to I'm trying to uh, keep it slow and and easy so that you can take uh, as much out of this talk as possible. So one of the first questions uh, you may have is how did I come to work with social robots? And the nice thing here is that, um, of course, as a human computer interaction uh, professor, you, you, come, you come up with all kinds of things. Uh, you come up with uh, interfaces, usability, user experience, um, communication issues. Um, and of course, there's autonomous vehicles and there's also robots. So, so why social robots? And this is actually, uh, because I'm a member of Agia, because uh, when I was uh, starting to work uh, with Agia, more than five years ago, there was a thing called idea competition. And um, I thought, what, what, what kind of research uh, is viable? What kind of research is good for persons with so diverse backgrounds, because in Agia, we have historians, we have medical doctors, we have uh, physicists, we have lots of people from the humanities. And um, when I came up with the social robots topic, because social robots, of course, combine all that. There are ethical issues, there are medical issues, as you can see on the uh, little photo here. Um, of course, there's technology. So sort of everything comes together in the research on social robotics. So that was a major motivation for me to sort of dive deeper into that topic. Um, I will now with you, together with you try to predict the future of social robots, but as you know, predicting the future is difficult. So I have a quote here, and um, I wonder if somebody of you knows who said that. In from three to eight years, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. I mean, a machine that will be able to read Shakespeare, tell a joke, have a fight. Somebody familiar with that? Quotation. Oh. It's, it's hard for me to tell if somebody's raising the hand. You can just shout out the name if you know, or write it in the chat. It doesn't seem to be the case. Um, it's, a, it's a rather famous quotation because it's, so, it's, um, it's rare. Uh, as you know, as researchers, we are very careful with making predictions. And it's rare that somebody is uh, so uh, bold to actually do that. And the guy who did that uh, looks like a, a nice young uh, grandpa. And actually, um, um, he, he, he is an old guy by now because he was one of the founders of uh, the artificial intelligence research, which is uh, essential for everything uh, we do in computer science now. So without him, there would be no Google, no Facebook, and of course also no social robots. So Marvin Minsky is considered one of the fathers of artificial intelligence. And he gave that quotation in the Time Magazine in 1970. So that's 50 years back. Uh, 2021 and 1970, it's 51 years. And as you may have noticed, there are no machines around with the general intelligence of an average human being, not even machines with the intelligence of a stupid human being, uh, not even machines with the intelligence, intelligence of a, a child or a baby child. So we are still working on that. Um, 50 years later, and uh, Marvin Minsky in 1970 thought what it would be a thing which would be solved in three to eight years. And I think this is, uh, this is one of these famous quotes. Uh, we are, another one would be the quote by this 
<coughs> IBM director who said, um, on the whole world, there's only uh, a need for five to eight computers. Uh, and now we have over a billion. Um, so these are famous wrong predictions. Um, and Marvin Minsky, he surely was an expert on the topic and he should have known better, but obviously he also was a big optimist. And um, in this case, he was uh, completely wrong. And to be honest, me as a, as a computer science professor, if you, if you would ask me, when will we have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being? I would rather say it's another 50 years when it's another, when, when less than that. Um, so I think we are closer to having half the way, having done half the way, when um, having done the full way. So maybe um, probably I can uh, have another talk in 50 years, um, maybe here at this conference when I'm 97 and say, finally, we are having machines which are as clever as humans, um, but I'm not so sure about that. All right. so. Social robots, what are they? What can they do? You all know these industrial robots. They are very common in Germany, for example, for car manufacturing. But they are, of course, restricted to production oriented tasks. And often we are in controlled areas which you're not allowed to enter because they are dangerous, they are not programmed to know what a human being is and they could hurt you if you enter uh, this restricted area. On the other hand, there are service robots. And here you have uh, the service robot Robear, which was developed by Riken, a Japanese company. And they are done, they, are, they have been designed to do as the industrial standard organization says, uh, useful tasks for humans, which aid in physical tasks, such as helping people to move around. Here you see that Robert can actually carry a person. So is Robert a social robot? Not yet, because in addition to being able to interact with humans, a social robot also needs to communicate. When you could ask yourself, but, but a chatbot, for example, or a, an avatar, uh, like a non-player character in a game, were well, also communicating with me. Are they social robots? No, they are not, because a, a robot needs to be physically embodied. And um, as I also tell my students, um, it is also important that it can move around. So it's if you have something with a casing, um, it's not a robot yet if it can move. So it needs sensors and it needs actuators. And then it's a robot. And then if it can also communicate with uh, persons, it doesn't have to be language. It can also communicate via other means, for example, via movements. We will have examples for that soon. Um, then it's a social robot. So uh, as a definition, we could say social robots are physically embodied and interact and communicate with humans or other robots by following social behaviors and rules. So that's our working definition of social robots in that talk. So let's look at some social robots which are already there on the market. This one you already know, the Robear. And you also know that yeah, if you listen 
closely, you know that it's not really a social robot. Uh, it's actually just a service robot. So when you next time somebody says Robert is a social robot, you can correct him and say, no, no, I learned that uh, the Robert is just a service robot because it cannot communicate. Yeah, look, uh, it has a mouth. Uh, it has, a, but it it could not talk. It's just um, it's just a decoration. Uh, so it can only lift persons. It's a little bit like a like a machine, uh, which looks like a, an animal, but uh, technologically, it's it's. Uh, the, the focus is on the motor skills rather than intelligence or the ability to, to communicate. <clears throat> this here, this guy you will probably know, uh, the, the guy on the left, the guy on the right you also know uh, by now, um, that's the Pepper. And uh, Pepper you will find in, in many universities, uh, maybe uh, you also have one at your university, it was uh, developed by SoftBank Robotics. And um, the good thing is it can do a lot of things. As you can see, it has uh, decent hands, so it can uh, do little things like grabbing stuff. Um, it's an all-rounder. Um, I wouldn't say that it is useful for anything in particular. So um, you couldn't use it, for example, to help you with uh, elderly patients in a hospital. Uh, it, it, it is not strong enough uh, to <clears throat> actually do something. And even if you would tell it, uh, could you bring me a glass of water? What well, would be way beyond its, its uh, capabilities because for grabbing a glass of water, you need a very good sensor motor skills and um, the pepper does not have them. Uh, it's, it's simply too cheap. Uh, it's not... Uh, if you if you're looking for a computer uh, for a, a robot which can actually grasp things uh, with a hand, uh, you need to build an, an artificial hand, and typically um, you are way be beyond uh, fifty thousand euros for robots which can do such such things. And the pepper is around twenty thousand euros if you buy it, so maybe around thirty twenty five to thirty thousand dollars. So for a robot, that is that is considered cheap. Uh, so the, the sort of the, the robots on the higher end, they are more like two hundred thousand or, or even more euros. So Pepper is a cheap robot, but it can do some things, um, especially with this tablet um, on the chest. It can uh, we can use it to communicate, for example, with patients. This year is uh, the care robot uh, by Fraunhofer. So I've been working uh, with Fraunhofer a lot and actually my company is a spin-off of Fraunhofer. And as you see, it can hold a rose. So that is, that is already a positive uh, development, but uh, it still is very limited. And I haven't seen, seen it actually working in a hospital so far. So I would say it's, promising, but it's still under development. There is this guy here. It's much more advanced because it doesn't try to do a lot of things. It just does one thing. And I'm quite sure that many of you already know the name of this little guy. Um, it's called Paro and it's a robotic seal. So it's a robotic animal. And actually, this is a social robot. So a social robot does not have to look like a, a human person. Um, it's a social robot looking like an animal. And it's used um, to work with elderly, so in, in elderly care centers. And then, of course, you could ask, why are we not using cats, for example, uh, real animals? And the problem is that if you have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, you will uh, typically have this, this uh, repetitive movements. You will do the same thing over and over again. And this can be very annoying for the animals. So it is not good for the animal. And also there are problems with allergies. Uh, the, the elderly people, especially if they are far beyond 80, they, they are very fra fragile and they, they can easily 
uh, get ill. And so you want to, to keep them away from animal bacteria. And uh, um, so an artificial animal is a big improvement for them. And actually there are a lot of studies which show that the Paro um, is a successful uh, innovation, a social robot, which actually helps persons. So this guy here next to an employee of mine um, is called Cutie. And Cutie is designed to help children with disorders in the autism, the autism spectrum. Um, it can move the hands, it can wave, uh, it can make funny noises, it can talk. Uh, but as you see, it's, it looks a little bit like a, like a, a, a toy. And maybe it is uh, in some ways, it's a, <coughs> a sophisticated toy which you can program and which you can use to um, interact with children with uh, these kinds of disorders. And for them, it's, it's very uh, demanding to interact with real people because they can easily become overwhelmed by the complexity of social interactions and interacting with this nice little robot sort of helps them to train uh, communication uh, at all so that we can sort of um, be trained to communicate with a person with this little robot. So these are a few examples and here on the next slide I have even more examples. Uh, Jibo, for example, is a robot uh, which you may know. It looks. Uh, it, it, in this case, we could we could discuss if it's if it's a robot at all because it cannot really move a lot. There is Buddy, and there is a, a robot which is called Lia, which looks like a like a wheelchair almost. Um, of course, the Pepper, Oshbot, Ream. There's so many. Um, um, different robots around. If you if you're into that, if you if you want to know more, the IEEE has a nice uh, a nice uh, website robots.ieee.org, and there is a sort of a list of robots, all the robots which are currently around, and it's actually it's hundreds of robots. Of course, most of them are not social robots, but you can uh, filter that. And uh, you can sort of see uh, what is developed. And often you just have one or two or three prototypes. Uh, for example, at Offenburg University, we have a robot uh, which is designed to play soccer. And it, it's rather successful, but that's sort of the only thing it can do. It can only play soccer. So by definition, it wouldn't be a social robot uh, because it, it doesn't really communicate with other robots or with persons, it just aims uh, to shoot a ball into the goal. Uh, so that's the aim. And they are actually there, um, there are championships for that. Robot soccer is a big thing and it's perfect for students to train their um, skills as an electrical engineer to work on that robot and improve it, but it's not a social robot, although it does something like playing soccer, which is a very social thing. Uh, only, only humans do it. They only do it for entertainment uh, or for sports. But um, the robot, which does the same thing, uh, is not a social robot just because it's a social activity. So what's the technology behind? Because this is an ACM uh, conference. Let's also talk a little bit about uh, the technology. So these are all stuff, this is all stuff which is used. And this is just for now, it's a simple, uh, simple robot, also about the height of the QT. Um, so you have 3D audio, you have haptic sensors, you of course uh, have a video, you have depth information like the Kinect, for example, uh, also can, can assess. You have infrared and all this is uh, fused. So a sense of fusion is taking place and then there is a pattern recognition going on, which can be enhanced by machine learning. Uh, if you wanna sort of say, this is a vase or this is a chair, you need to train first uh, um, 
uh, you need to train the robot, you need to train the image recognition, say this is a typical chair, this is a typical waist, and this way uh, the robot learns to identify certain objects. And the same can be done with persons. And actually there is also now uh, robots around which can do a little bit of um, effective uh, state recognition. So that's, that would be important for a social robot that it sort of sees, okay, somebody is smiling, that is a good response. Somebody is angry, that is a bad response. So maybe I have to excuse myself or something. Um, so, so for social robot, uh, detecting these effective states is an important, would be an important feature. And I could do a whole talk just about that. But uh, I want to, in this talk, I want to give you sort of a, a greater spectrum. And so we won't go too far into the technology and we won't go too far um, into the um, effective state recognition issue. It's just an overview. And it's important for you that you sort of at least heard about what is, what is possible, like eye tracking, voice analysis, and so on. So my, my talk has this, uh, this term uh, in it called plateau of productivity. And, and maybe you ask yourself, what does what plateau of productivity means, mean? And it's actually, it comes from the Gartner hype cycle, which probably most of you know. So those of you who don't, uh, it's, it, it comes out every year and it sort of shows um, what kind of uh, technologies are on the rise. And uh, the, the important thing is here down, down below uh, that it's uh, these phases, there's the innovation trigger, then there's the peak of inflated expectations, then the through of disillusionment, the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. And um, they also, well, the, the color of uh, the dot is like a prediction, a time prediction. So for example, they say that the cloud office will be, the plateau will be reached in less than two years. Uh, or here for the chat bots, uh, you see that they are still sort of on the decline. So they will go through this through of disillusionment, but then uh, two to five years, the plateau will be reached. That's their prediction, the prediction of Gartner. And as you see, there is no social robots around. So um, you could say that there are virtual assistants, then there are conversational user interfaces, uh, then there is robotic process automation. If we take all these three things together and we see, okay, that's two to five years, two to five years, and here five to 10 years. So where are social robots? Right now, yeah, I would say we are at least five to 10 years, probably this triangle more than 10 years. And of course you can say, but you just showed us social robots. I mean, they are on the market already. Yes, that's true, but they are not on the plateau of productivity because just because I can buy something doesn't mean uh, that it has value because if they had value, you would all own a social robot by now. Um, if it had enough value, if it would be like a butler or a servant and it could actually help you with your, um, with your laundry, it could clean your rooms, it would be a nice uh, person or nice, a nice thing to chat to, it could watch for your children, uh, you would all probably try to buy one. And those who are better off would pay 100,000 euros for something like that. I would pay that uh, because uh, that would be a huge, um, a huge improvement. Um, some uh, entity which is always ready, which can always help you, which can clean your, your uh, stuff at night and care for your children at day when you're away. So that would be a really cool thing, but it's, it's far from uh, in the reach right now. So even if you have uh, like uh, more uh, exact use cases, like uh, the health support, um, 
bringing medicine or something, even these very narrow use cases, there is still a lot uh, to be done here. Now, this is another interesting uh, chart where you see sort of the involvement of um, social robots that's from uh, KPMG 2016. I think it's still valid starting as a concierge. So somebody's just standing at the door telling you, okay, we are closed or you have to go, uh, if you wanna go to the toilet, you have to go in this direction. So that's a simple thing going over helper, teammate, friend, and potentially coach. 2050, it's their prediction. I, I'm not sure um, about the time scale, but uh, that's why we do research on that topic. So a few questions, how should social robots look like and what should, we, should they be able to do and what shouldn't they be able to do? And for that, I typically do this interactively. Um, so I can, I can see you, I could ask you, social robots should be able to move. So who would agree with that? Uh, I guess everybody would agree with that because if they couldn't move, um, they wouldn't be very helpful and it would not even be social robots at all. But then you could, we could ask ourselves, should we also be able to climb stairs? And there are robots which can do that, but it's, it's a very complicated thing actually for a robot to climb the stair. And that's a, that's a video uh, from a robot at DARPA, which you'll probably not see very well because of the transmission time. But you, you're probably seeing that it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated robot. So if you look at all the cables and all the actuators there, and the question is, is that something desirable? Uh, do we want a robot to be able to climb stairs? And I think that's, that depends heavily on the perception we have. So maybe uh, if uh, the robots become bad, uh, like in a Terminator movie, it's a good thing if you can just climb up the stair and the robot cannot follow you. But on the other hand, if you're an elderly person and uh, your sleeping room is upstairs, uh, you want the robot to be able to climb stairs because otherwise it can't help you to go to bed. So this is a good example of um, functionality. It highly depends on the perception. So if you're afraid of robots, well, you would probably say, oh no, I don't want it to be able to climb stairs. And if you're very technology friendly and optimistic person, you'll say, of course, it should be able to climb stairs because otherwise it can help me as good uh, as it can if it can climb stairs. So other questions would be the appearance. The appearance. And many think that um, social robots should look similar to humans and they should have a face resembling the human face. So this, in my opinion, resembles the human face because you have two eyes and a kind of a mouth. There is no nose, but that's okay. Many smileys also don't have a nose. Uh, we can sort of still immediately detect the human face. But on the other hand, there are things like this. So this is Sophia from Hanson Robotics. Um, in my opinion, this is not a good example of a social robot. It's more like, a, in my opinion, it's more like a marketing gadget. Uh, a little bit like the Mechanical Turk, for those of you who are familiar with the history of computer science. So Sophia, uh, lots of videos of Sophia on YouTube, and you will see her talk about all kinds of things. And she says she, that, she wanna have, that she wants to have children, and she says that she wants to have, um, wants to um, have an own company or something, but these are all pre-programmed uh, answers. And of course, there's no robot around which uh, is able to do anything um, like start a business or even have children. I mean, how crazy is that? Uh, what, would, what would it even mean? Uh, I mean, a, a robot, if it would be very good, could build another robot just like it, but that would be a clone and not a child. So, um, nevertheless, 
this Sophia, of course, really looks like a, um, a human. And if you, if you watch these YouTube videos, you see that the face is exactly like a human face and there are even these mimic details. And uh, then you could, of course, ask yourself, is that something which is desirable? Do we, do we want that? Uh, is, it, is it a plus that Sophia has this human face? And uh, in this case, I, I really want uh, to ask you, the audience, so I can see you on my screen. And those of you who think that it's a good idea that uh, a social robot should have a human face, please raise your hand. Okay, I see, I would say about 20% of hands. So does this mean who, who thinks that a robot doesn't, should not have a human face like Sophia? Okay. Similar, most of you are sort of undecided. Yeah. Um, if you do research on that, um, you see that actually there is um, the majority of people, they prefer something which is more like the now on the left. So they don't want a robot to become too human-like. And I once had a nice talk at, uh, it's called Children University. So lots of children are there and, and they often ask the cool questions. And um, one little guy, he, he said, I, I always want to know if it's a robot or a real human. So um, I think this sort of accounts for this awkwardness if the social robot looks too much like human. And we want to be sure that we are talking to a human and not to a robot. Uh, if you look like, like in the science fiction movies, where you cannot really tell if something is a robot or a human. So of course, the directors, uh, the story people are playing with these, with these fears, uh, the fear that we are losing our humanity or that we are even overtaken by robots. And I think that this is something substantial. And for that reason, if I would design a robot, I would make it in a way that it is clear that it's not a human. Uh, I think the robot is a good example. It's, it has this anthropomorphism. So it, it, is, it looks, it is humanized. It looks like human. It looks like a mixture between a bear and a human, but nobody would take a uh, robot and say, oh, I almost mistook you for my friend Charlie, uh, because it definitely does not look uh, like a human, but still it's humanized. It's a little bit like these cartoon characters uh, from Disney. Uh, if you think of Mowgli, for example, Baloo the bear who can walk and talk and has these mimical expressions. I think that this is probably the way to go with uh, social robots. Yeah, when you could ask yourself, should they behave as if they have emotions? I have here a little video um, showing that, for example, the now uh, can actually dance and move around, which in my opinion is a fun thing. And if you, if you think about um, communication, some level of emotions are helpful. So for example, if you uh, push the robot, it should uh, look angry so that uh, you immediately see that this was not a good idea. Uh, but this is something research is still ongoing. And then there is of course uh, the question of talk. And here, I guess you don't hear my audio, but you see that uh, Sophia can move her face uh, and she has these um, very authentic um, uh, expressions which are actually like, uh, like real humans. Uh, and I think this definitely goes too far. Uh, if I, would have, a, if I would, would have a robotic servant at my home, I wouldn't want it to look uh, like Sophia. I would rather want it to look like um, Robert or something so that it's completely clear that it's a machine and even a child or a baby knows this is, this is not an, uh, a real a living entity. This is just a machine, a clever machine.
So what do we want to happen in the future? And this is a question I've been working on a lot, of course. And this is from, these are results from the AAL forum 2016. That's the Active Assisted Living Forum. And here I already asked quest questions like so, social robots should be able to move, social robots should be able to climb stairs and so on. And this is the, the image uh, which we got in 2016. Uh, so like everybody said, yes, social robots should be able to talk. That was like 5.0. Uh, if you look at the Likert scale on the top, one is strongly disagree, five is strongly agree. So five means completely, completely in line with that. Movement, almost four. Climbing stairs, 3.2. Here you see this, uh, this um, uneasiness, yeah? looking similar to humans, only 2.9. Human face also 2.9 and behave emotional 3.3. I think that gives a good impression of what we just uh, talked about. If we now look at health, because this is an especially important area for social robots, because in Germany and actually in the whole of Europe, we have a demographic problem and we have lots of elderly people, but not so many people to care for them. And so social robots would be a, a help to solve that problem. And um, also 2016, I did an, uh, a Delphi study based on a workshop at the AAL forum. And what was the results here? So out of these 20 experts asked, do you, would, would you like a, a, a social robot to put you into another bed? So 3.5 uh, out of uh, five out of like its scale. Going to the toilet, it was 4.7. So almost complete agreement. Every day talk, very, very little agreement. So ob obviously the people don't want to talk with social robots, which is one them to help. And here high acceptance rates for medical tasks like taking medicine, or plot wrong. And I also asked them, in what year do you expect like a widespread use of automated systems which support caregivers at physical work? So care robots are a special kind of social robots, which is uh, in the care area. And here you say 2024, and you see that this is completely over-optimistic and it will at least be another 10 years. And for the other predictions, I also think that they have been too optimistic. And this is typical. I mean, we, we've seen what Marvin Mis Minsky said at the start, and he was an expert and he misjudged for over 50 years, that's five decades. And just imagine that. So just because you're an expert doesn't mean that you can predict the future. So if you look at these numbers uh, of quotations like the one from Marvin Minsky, that really helps to humble yourself as a re researcher because it shows that just because you're an expert, you still can make accurate predictions always. So now let's look at uh, social robots for different cultures because that was a study I was doing for Agia. And the first thing we did, um, was see how the Western and the Arab world sort of differs. Uh, for example, with greetings. Yeah? So this is the typical Western greeting, whereas this would be probably a nicer greeting in the Arab world, but that's sort of still harmless, easy stuff. Um, because this here, this gesture, the, the, the uh, lady does like this in Arab, stands for my pleasure, whereas in the Western world, this means I understand that you're being ironic. So that's a completely uh, different meaning. Or raising both hands like this uh, would be, I swear to God, rather, I have no idea. Uh, this may be just typical gestures, but um, it shows that if you program a social robot to do certain gestures, and they are Western gestures, and you, when you put it into an Arab country, it would probably not work very well because the gestures 
are adapted for a certain cultural space. And then we come to things like this. Uh, the thumbs up, as you all know, is a good thing in Western cultures, but not really in the Arab cultures. So everybody should know that because um, going into an Arab country and giving thumbs up all the time is just uh, not a good idea. And the other gesture, it's the other way around. So that in, in Germany means perfect. Everything's perfect. Uh, excellent meal. And as you know, in Arab, it's a threat. It means the devil's eye. So lots and lots of possibilities to make huge errors if you want to create a social robot, um, which is actually good for something. And we summarized that into like a comparison of the Western and um, the Arab cultural framework, like a high context and low context culture, linear versus non-linear cultures. So this would all have to be um, taken into account if you would create social robots for a specific culture. So these are a few um, references which we worked with. And when all this sort of came into one big study, a survey with 794 participants from Germany and Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, uh, a, star, a study I did with Agia, together with Agia. And here you see um, a questionnaire in Arabic and uh, in English, of course. And I think we also did it in French uh, and in German, of course. And here are some of the results. And this is, of course, this is a journal paper, so it's, it's very scientific. Uh, but here, for example, you see that when you look at abilities like talking or understanding speech, Germany and Egypt are actually more similar than many Arab countries. So obviously, it's not as easy as we thought. Uh, you cannot just say, OK, we are the Arab count, uh, countries and there is the Western countries. Obviously, within the Arab countries, there are still considerable differences. However, all cultures un and anonymously do not like social robots which behave too much like humans. So obviously we are feeling uneasy if that happens. And when we look at these health activities like blood tests being put into bed and so on, um, where you see that the Germans and you probably think that the Germans are very technology friendly, but it's not the case in all areas. The Germans are much more skeptical in many health related activities. And the Germans, uh, remember, are the, the people who would need that most uh, because we have this, uh, this unfortunate old age support ratio. So that's the technical term. The number of people who can support elderly is rather low in Germany. So the picture is diverse. You cannot just say the Western culture versus the Arab culture. This does not account for all the differences. So there's a lot of work uh, to do here. So to conclude my talk, so these are actually pictures from a science comic we did on social robotics, where I will also show you the link. But I think this, this shows this, it's a science comic. So it's not the reality yet. So social robots, social robotics are gaining much interest from researchers. There's a lot, lots and lots of uh, publications. There's even, there's a journal on social robots. There's a conference on social robotics, but the current applications are technologically limited. The plateau of productivity is not yet reached. So if you look at the image at the bottom, and you see this robot, which is carrying the tablet with a glass of water. And most of you who are experts, they will, uh, because I, I, I enlarge that part, they will see that this is not true. This is just 
a made up thing. This is Photoshopped. Uh, this is like uh, uh, my face on Instagram. Uh, so this is not the reality. Uh, this is fake. So there is not a robot around currently which can carry a tablet around and help you at uh, in, in, in health situations in the hospital. This is ongoing research and maybe in five years or in 10 years, there will be a robot like that, but currently there is none. Western and Arab culture are different on many levels. Uh, I showed you all these, these uh, images and the, the difference between the collectivist culture and the individual culture. Um, and that the even simple gestures can have utterly different meanings. So to be successful, social robots should account for such differences. And finally, our research we did with Agia showed us that it's not as simple as Western society, Western cultures versus Arab cultures. There's a big difference between a person from Saudi Arabia and a person uh, from Libya or a person from Egypt. And of course, there are individual differences, but even if you sort of uh, take the mean, there are big differences between the various Arab cultures. Yeah, that was my final slide. And here, those of you who are interested in the topic, I did also with the help of Agia, a science comic on this uh, topic, which you can read for free online. Um, if you Google science comic, uh, you will find it. There's also a book, a Springer book on that topic, if you're more of a reading type. Um, yeah, and of course, you can always contact me on ResearchGate or via email if you want to enter in a personal discussion. So thanks for your attention. And uh, it was a Thank pleasure you. to be talking here. Thanks. Thank you, Oliver, for uh, a great presentation and for the information. And uh, if you can read the chat, we have a few questions, or I should read it to you. I can look at the chat. Okay. So let me start with, uh, any questions. This... Mm -hmm. ah? OK. My point is. This is my cue. Let's phone to Google. Yes, ma'am. Oh. My phone is now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, man, so we'll, okay. Okay, uh, we'll answer the first question in the chat, please, Oliver, until the question from the audience will be prepared. Please, please look to the Q and A. In the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Q and A, yes. I'm seeing that. Yes. Do you think that social robots will cost an amount that is within reach of a middle-class family? That's a good question. Uh, and uh, I always say that uh, robots will become the next cars. Um, cars, at least in, in, in Europe, become less important than they used to be. And I think the same will happen in other areas. So if we think about something like 50,000 euros, that would be the amount of money a middle-class family would invest in a good, decent car. I think that um, social robots will get in that range within the next 20 years. Uh, so I'm quite, I'm quite optimistic about that. I mean, you all ha already have these cleaning robots around. Now imagine the cleaning robot could also do your laundry. And then imagine the cleaning robot could also look for your children. And then you sort of, you already have it. And probably it will not be able to climb stairs because that is very expensive and very complicated, but um, I'm quite... So. Okay, uh, I'd like to 
I'm sorry, but I, I, I only understand fragments. So if you could uh, repeat the, the question or just summarize it, if a moderator could summarize the question, I'd be happy to ask, but I only understand about a third of what you're saying into a microphone. No, no, I, I don't understand what you're saying over the microphone. Um, please, please just, uh, Ali, if you could uh, repeat it or if you, if you. Um... Yes, uh, Dr. Oliver, he talking about the future of the social mm -hmm. report. Yes. Yes, it could be mm -hmm. used for the for war. peaceful or the unpeaceful purpose, like in the war. Ah, yeah, yeah. I also see, I've also seen this question <laughs> about the um, law enforcement. So there are, there are uh, in Singapore, for example, there is a project where social robots are used uh, for law enforcement. And this is, this is a big thing also in other uh, cultures. And actually, if you, if you would be cynical, would, you could say that the, <coughs> the social robot, which is most successful, are the killing drones from the United States, of course, because they, they are autonomous. They can move because they can fly. Um, they are identifying target persons <coughs> and they are interacting with them by killing them. Um, so, of course, a drone, a military drone, is not really um, our idea of a social robot. But if it comes to, if you just sort of uh, consider it as a technology platform, these are the kind of social, and in this case, anti social robots which are most advanced. But nevertheless, I would say that the military area is a special area. And typically when we talk about social robots, we do not think about uh, military drones because that's, that's really a special area. But the, the military or the, 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 the law enforcement robot, that would be a good thing because it, it wouldn't have to sort of, um, be able to arrest persons, but if it would just move around with a video camera, uh, for example, see that people are not throwing away uh, rubbish uh, in public places, seeing that people are behaving in good order, uh, that, that women are respected, uh, that people are friendly towards each other. I think that would be that would be a good thing, because we all have we already have a video surveillance in many public areas. But the problem with video surveillance is that it is not perceived. Uh, often people sort of forget about these cameras, and a robot which would actually move in a public space, maybe even uh, talk with persons and say, "Please don't smoke. Smoking is prohibited here." Uh, that would be in my opinion, a good area of application. Uh, well knowing that you could of course take the robot and throw it into a trash bin or just throw it away. But of course, if you would do that, that would be like uh, um, hurting a police officer. Yeah. Thank you, Oliver, for the presentation and for answering the questions. And uh, thank you very much.
It was a pleasure. Thanks. It was, yeah, it uh, was a great pleasure to have you with us today. And uh, we hope next time we see you in person in Benghazi. Yes. It would be, I, I would have come, but I know how difficult it is right now. Yeah. Thank you so, very much. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Have a wonderful okay. conference. Yes. Okay. Thank you. نقطة واحدة بس المايك دكتور والجميع المايك لما تبي به هو مش حيسمع لأن هو حيسمع مني أنا بس كان السؤال وأنا حندير له بارافريزنج السؤال ونسأل له بس هذه كانت النقطة هو مش حيسمع السؤال بالمايك نحن حنسمعه بس الأحسن شنو أنه المحاضرة الجاية ممكن السؤال تكون فردة ونحن نقدر نجمع لأن المايك أول معلوم عليها uh now we are going to move to the next keynote speakers uh the talk will, will be about the engineering quantum materials for energy relevant technology uh dr mahmoud abdul hafiz uh, is associated professor at Uppsala university from sweden and also uh, from a good uh, university of frankfurt from germany and a member of the Arab German Young Academy of Science and Humanities, Agia, uh, specialized in physics, material science, uh, and uh, he is a researcher focused on interdisciplinary uh, directions, including the material preparation and the characteristics of quantum material. Um, hello, Dr. Mahmoud. Mahmoud? Samani, Assalamu alaikum. وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله صباح الخير محمود ونحن مبسوطين يعني انك انت معنا اليوم الصوت كويس واصل الصوت واضح ومسموع بطريقه جيده جدا شكرا شكرا السلام عليكم ايفري وان سو اتس ا جريت بليجر اند اي ويش اي كود ريلي بي فيزيكالي رايت ناو ان ليبيا بيكوز اتس ا جريت اتموسفير تو بي زير ات ذا مومنت بس ان شاء الله نيكست يير اي اي ويل بي فيزيكالي ان شاء الله Uh, today, I will give you an overview about a very interesting topic about quantum materials. Uh, 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 thanks to Oliver, but is this, is this a new topic and which will touch uh, interdisciplinary research, including uh, material science, engineering, uh, physics, and also information technology. And uh, uh, my name is Mahmoud Abdel Hafiz. I'm originally from Egypt. And uh, currently, I'm um, associate professor based in, in, in Uppsala University in Sweden, and also as a, a research associate at Harvard University in the States. My research uh, focuses on studying uh, quantum uh, materials and uh, uh, discovering the new materials for energy uh, technology. And uh, uh, today, my research funded from several agencies like Agia and also from uh, uh, a German Foundation, and as well as also from the Swedish uh, government. So uh, today I will show you how we characterize uh, this quantum material using high pressure uh, 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 techniques, which is a very unique and is a very important for uh, uh, quantum materials. And I will show you also how do we make these kind of materials in a very high uh, quality. So uh, let me start with a very simple uh, uh, questions about material. So if I give you a material and uh, if you look to the atomic scale, so what you will see. So uh, uh, you will see the first thing is that uh, if you have a single crystals, you will see arrangement of atoms or we call it crystal lattice or crystal structure. Based on that crystal structure, you can get also the properties of your materials. And if you zoom out more uh, to the atoms, you will see electrons, because if you look to the periodic table in higher, it has, it shows like uh, 26 electrons. And based on the electronic configuration here, what you see here is orbitals S, uh, an orbital B, an orbital D, where the uh, 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 electrons can be based on it. And uh, uh, for the S orbitals, it's only allowed with two electrons, while two, uh, while two B orbitals, it's only allowed with six electrons, which you get up from high school chemistry. So inside materials, there is crystal lattice and electrons. And uh, in order to study the properties of a material, you have to know what the electrons are doing. That's what I'm going to show 
uh, in my talks uh, from now. Let me flash back from the Newtonian physics where the electrons have got mass. And the, the kinetic energy of electrons can be given by half mv squared. And you can also estimate the energy in terms of momentum, where the momentum here is the linear momentum, which is the electron mass times the velocity. And the one way to describe particles that have good mass is to study the relation between energy and momentum. In that case, you will see a quadratic and you will see the parabola term, or we call it classical materials. But however, Einstein revised Newtonian physics and he considered that particles might have a speed close to the speed of light. That means the relation between energy and momentum is not no longer uh, uh, quadratic, but you can see it linear relationship between the energy and momentum. Based on Einstein relativistic theory, one of the greatest scientists last century, Paul Dirac, he discovered many things. One of the great discovery that he find uh, a solution and the properties of electrons that have spins. And this is spins like spin up or spin down. It's analog of angular momentum. It's not linear momentum. So, and this is spin act as a very tiny magnet. So inside the electrons, it's a tiny magnet. That means you can also define what kind of materials uh, you have. So in classical materials, we consider electrons uh, as a tiny charged ball. I consider that if you have a basketball and you have this, the skill, so you can spin the ball in this direction, in this direction, in any kind of directions. But now, how about quantum materials, which is our uh, topics today? How is the equivalent curve like that? So what we will see here, the relation between energy and momentum is quite complicated. And even people call that also spaghetti. So where this spaghetti lines comes from, actually because, because we are dealing with electrons are moving in a very complicated system. And that system has a lot of atoms and each atom contains a lot of energy level. So what you see here is a mini particle systems. So we consider here electrons not as a tiny charged uh, uh, pole, but we consider it as a wave shape. Electron has a wave property and the electrons have also spin. But one of the most important, you can see it from this figure, you can look also to the bottom curve here. It has the same curve like that one, which you can consider as also electrons in a vacuum, but that's not because the diversion is different. That means what it changes here is the mass. So in quantum materials, electron-electron interactions gives you a rise to or enhance the mass of the electron which is in a class of materials called heavy fermions. Another important point, you can see it also here, there is a break in the energy. And this break, we call it like energy gap. And that's the energy gap of your semiconductors, of your conductors and uh, insulators and so on. So to make that based on this energy gap, so there are different kind of uh, materials like either from uh, conductors, semiconductors and insulators. In the case of insulators, you can see the energy gap is huge between the valence band and the conduction band. And you cannot excite electrons from the valence band to be in a conduction band, and that's like diamond. So in a semiconductor like a silicon or germanium, so the energy gap is small that you can excite the electrons to be in the lower curve here of the conduction band. While in conductors, you can see this overlap, this overlap is sure electrons that conducting things. However, however, the conductors, uh, 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 electrons, as you can see it here, the red point is the atoms and the small poles here is the electrons. So the electrons once hit atoms, it loses energy. And this loss of energy, you pay also for it. It's like, like, like you're a charger in the computer. So if, if you charge it many times, so you feel it's hot, this heat is a loss of energy and even you pay for it. So that means the, the copper is a good conductor, but it's not a perfect conductor. That means is there is a material in nature that can conduct electricity without hitting the atoms or without no loss of energy? The answer is yes. We call it superconductors. So this class of material, we call it superconductors, which conduct electricity without no loss of energy. So for now, I will tell you the history about uh, super uh, conductivity from being discovered even till today, because it's a very important topic for energy community, particularly in, the, in our Arab region. 
So uh, the history of superconductivity being discovered in 1911 and the Nobel Prize got in 1913 by uh, 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 Cameron Cole Honest from Leiden University in the Netherlands, where he measured the mercury. And what he can see here, that is a relation between the resistance and the temperature. So in case of conductor, you can see the resistance goes down with temperature, but still here there is a residual resistivity ratio. So that means it's not a perfect conductor. However, in a superconductor, you can see it behaves as a conductor, but suddenly there is no resistance at all. And this is TC related to the superconducting the transition. So the first point in superconductivity, if someone asked you what does superconductivity mean, first point is zero resistance, absolute zero. Second point also discovered in Leipzig University where it's Meissner effect or Meissner Oxenfeld. And uh, Oxenfeld was a graduate student of Meissner. And where he found that he found that the magnetic field expelled superconductivity at low temperature. And it's written in, in the book of, 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 the, uh, of this effect exactly that Oxenfeld went to uh, the Meissner office and he told him, Herr Meissner, so uh, magnetic field expelled superconductors. He told him, wunderbar, you just discovered Meissner effect. So second point of superconductor is the Meissner effect that superconductors do not like a, a magnetic field. And that's very important because if you look to this one, so that's here a magnet and here is superconducting cooled below the TC. So as you can see, you cannot touch, uh, you cannot touch poles. That's quantum mechanical is forbidden at all. And that's the idea of maglev or magnetic levitation. And as you can see here from the, the demo here, that you have here a superconducting here uh, and the steam here is a nitrogen. And what you have here, here is a magnet. And it's really limited. There is no resistance at all. So that's the fast speed or the speed trains. OK, so uh, now the question is, how does it happen? Because in physics, you have to, uh, to, 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 to ask how or what or why, and so on. So look to this number, 1913. So to explain this phenomena, it took more than 50 years, 1972. Or we call it BCS, related to Bardin, Cooper, Schiffer. That's three uh, uh, American scientists. They make a, a theory that explain what, how uh, the resistance at low temperature becomes to zero. And the statement of the theory is like superconductivity cased by Cooper pairs. Cooper pairs related to the two electrons and they're mediated by phonon interaction into boson-like state. What does it mean? So you have two electrons becoming together and they are not any more fermions, but becoming boson states. So what does it mean also? So I, I, I will make it also simple for you. But first, you have to know there are in the world, there are two different kinds of particles. Either you have fermions or bosons. So fermions comes with a spin half, three half, five half, and so on. So electrons, protons, and neutrons are uh, uh, fermions. And due to the Pauli exclusion principle, you are not allowed to put more than two electrons in one state. It's like one S2. Due to, the Pauli, due to the Pauli exclusion principle, you have to go to 2s2 and 2b6 and so on. So you are not allowed to put more than one electron, uh, two electrons in one s state, for instance. But bosons are completely different because particles of light are bosons. And that is the idea also of how laser is working because you can occupy all uh, electrons in the same space of time. And the spins comes from zero, one, and two, and so on. So now the theory of the BCS says that two electrons become together. That means they are spin half and spin minus one half, the spins become zero. That means they are bosons. And they are bosons, that means they can occupy all states in, in the lower energy state. All the electrons can be condensated in the lowest energy state. That, so what does it mean also to make it zero resistance? Because if the electrons go in a, in a material and hit atoms, what happens? So it loses energy and then it goes to lowest energy state, okay? So suppose the electron already in the lowest energy state and it hits the atoms, so it cannot collide. It goes directly with, uh, without that. So that is the idea and that's quantum mechanically. So that's the conductor, this is sneaky waves for, of electrons. It loses a lot of energy, but for uh, superconductors, electrons know the way that they do not, it can, cannot collide the atoms at a lower temperature. So that's a quantum mechanically understood on that. 
that's only a, a, a theory for a conventional superconductors. But now we have the higher TC. We are looking for room temperature superconductor. What's happened to these uh, things? So in order to understand that, so in each kind of material, so there are several degrees of freedom. So we have to understand the interplay between charge, spin, orbital, and lattice. So all these degrees of freedom gives you a rise of fascinating phenomena, like high TC superconductivity, like magnetism, like a charge density waves, and so on. But in our case here, if you consider the interplay between charge and spin, you get such kind of high TC superconductor, which is not yet understood. And the, the end of the materials, as you can see here from the arrangement, that the electrons are really localized. They cannot interact. So what we do, we try to remove some electrons from here by doping. So once we dope the material, we shift the, the system from insulator to become superconductors, or from insulator to become metal, and so on. So now, uh, just to summarize here uh, from 1911, up to now, we are here in 22. So th this phenomena discovered in 1911 and the Nobel Prize got in 1913 and more than 50 years to understand uh, that behavior. But now there are a different class of high TC superconductors. We call it the uh, high TC uh, uh, unconventional superconductivity. First class discovered in 1979 by Frank Stieglich. He's currently now a professor at Max Planck in Dresden in Germany. When you find this kind of materials, we call it heavy fermions. If you remember, I told you the interaction between electron enhances the mass. In this class of material, the mass of the electron is 1,000 more higher than the uh, mass of the electron in the free space. So uh, uh, then a new class of material being uh, also discovered in 1986, a Nobel Prize in 1987, where they could enhance the TC more than 163 Kelvin. So, and in 2008, so the iron based superconductivity uh, being uh, uh, discovered, which is a very important class of material because I, I, I mentioned that magnetism and superconductivity do not like each other. But in this iron based iron is known a ferromagnet. How ferromagnet becomes a superconductor in one element, that's also an open question. That's why we're still working on this to understand as a behavior. So now we have two main open questions in the field. First, how to achieve the room, room temperature superconductor? That's hydrogen. That's uh, also a project we are working at Harvard University, where we try to compress hydrogen. Hydrogen is a gas. And if you compress it, if you compress the gas, it becomes a metal. And even if you compress it more, it becomes a superconductor. But that's only theory. We try to, to prove that experimentally. And if we can prove that experimentally, that is indeed a breakthrough. Not only with hydrogen, but also with some other class of materials, we are trying to enhance uh, superconductivity to room uh, temperature. So this one is already solved, it's a conventional one. However, for room temperature and also the theory behind high TC superconductor, it's still an open question. And that's why a lot of uh, people are keeping eyes working on uh, uh, this field. So why, why we are looking for that? This material will be really a breakthrough of uh, technology, of the future technology. We do not have a problem of energy, but our problem is how to uh, transmit energy and how to save energy. So uh, we have a problem in particular in our uh, Arab region that we have power stability and power transmission as well. Uh, this kind of materials from uh, quantum material will be the great efforts to help with this issue. We have also a problem how to uh, uh, send the power to the wind and solar farm. So, because as I mentioned, there are a lot of loss of energy because all the connection this was copper and the copper is not a perfect conductor. So once you, once you release the power there, it becomes more than 25% loss or 25% loss of the total power of that. This material will be also very important for the human beings that as I mentioned that magnetic levitation, Imagine that you are living uh, in, in 1,000 kilometers far from your work. So in, that means in 45 minutes, you're going to go to work and so on and come back. So that's very important to have such kind of uh, magnetic levitation or high speed train. These kind of materials will be support on that. Already, there is a, partic there is a particular uh, uh, applications for this material in CERN and the particle accelerator, as well as also for magnetic resonance imaging in the medical 
uh, part. Okay, how do we make uh, this kind of material? Actually, there are a lot of uh, activities on the growing this kind of material in high uh, quality. So one of the class of material, as you can see it here from the periodic table, we call it transition metal dicarbonides. These kind uh, of materials are very important for light emitting the nudes and so on. So it's like graphene. What you can see it here is a honeycomb lattice. It comes from 2H and also 1T. And you can easily cleave it up to, uh, uh, up to very low temperature. You can make it also devices on that. And, uh, and we can get very large single crystals out of it. You can see it also by your naked eyes. So using like uh, evaporation techniques, one can get a very large single crystals. And you can study a lot of things on, on this behind, behind this material because look to the high quality and this is in shiny of the surface. You can also see how is the layer of structure. So even by your tweezers, you can uh, cleave the materials to have a very shiny surface and so on. Uh, also, there is such kind of, we call it like flux technique. And that technique is also very, very important for particularly for iron-based material to achieve the high quality single crystals. And the single crystals is a very important to understand the physics or to, to understand the chemistry of the materials which we are working on that. So all crystal growth being already published in several places, you can also contact us for further information and also if you need any kind of material and or effort in these directions. Uh, apart from uh, uh, crystal growth, we have also unique techniques that is very important for different kinds of materials that we can study materials under pressure. Pressure here is a very clean tool because what you do, you do not change the chemistry of your material, but what you change, you change only the distance between ions. So by, by changing the distance between ions or atoms, you induce new phases and so on. So you can go from, from, from insulator to superconductors and so on. That's the experiment of hydrogen. Hydrogen is a gas and we try to, uh, to make it superconductors or room temperature superconductors. So how we do this experiment, we have two diamond view diamond apex together like that and in between the sample holder and we learn it in the school that pressure equal to super area so if you have a sample area here is a very small you can get a very high pressure and uh, and uh, we use a different kind of uh, pressure cell we can put also the pressure cell here to study several kind of optical properties like xrd like raman like uh, uh, maybe also in future there will be neutron under 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 pressure and so on so I want also to tell you that we have access to several kind of low temperature, high magnetic field facility. So if you need really any kind of characterization, don't hesitate to contact us to support or to help you if you do a measure or to do anything together. That's the idea of, of, of my talk. So we can have also here transport uh, 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 experiment down to 100 milli Kelvin. Even we can achieve up to uh, 30 Tesla with an Oxford degree stat, we have our uh, physical property measurement system that we can measure optical, we can measure also thermal properties, we can measure magnetic properties, heat capacity, and so on, as well as magnetic. So all this also can be uh, embedded with high pressure sink. So all these techniques are really unique in order to understand the uh, materials before saying anything about the kind of applications and to go beyond that. Okay, in the next few minutes, I would like to give you an example of what we have done in such kind of material. In principle, we have done a lot of work on this, uh, on this range of materials, but I, I will select only uh, one particular material on high TC superconductors. I remind you with this, uh, uh, this challenge is here, but we will work on this kind of iron-based uh, superconductors. And here, uh, 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 this class of material comes with like four uh, classes like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 2, 2, 11, 11. These numbers according to the composition ratio. So there are a lot of classes, but those, those are the main four systems in these things. If you look to 1, 1 and the 1, 1, 1 system, they are layered structures. So this layered structure, they are superconducted without any doping. So that's interesting because here, if you put ions here in between, you get also superconductivity. However, in 1, 2, 2 system and the 11, 11, the undoped material, it's not superconductor. So you have to dope the material. You have to remove electron from them to become superconductor. 
or we, you have to put the material under pressure to induce uh, superconductivity. So the highest DC here we achieve up to 55 Kelvin. So let me show you one example about one one system. So we we just five years ago we try to work on this kind of one one system iron selenium, and we were able to grow high quality single crystals and even to measure the uh, uh, transport and also to measure the uh, neutron on these kind of materials. And uh, what you see here is that the, 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 we call it the pack for transport measurement that can be implemented as a physical property measurement system. And if you see one, two, three, it's these uh, samples that you can put also three samples and you can measure three samples in one, one stage. So you cannot see, there is, you should believe me, there is a sample here, but you cannot see it because it's really in a micron. So we do that in, 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 a, in a glove box and also under optical microscope. So if you zoom out here, you will see the samples here and also the samples connected here. So it's 100 micron and, the, and the, this wire is like golden wire, it's 10 micron. So we have to make this uh, for contact and it's really, it's not, a, it's not a funny job, but it's really, it works very well. And once you make this kind, you can get a very nice uh, transition from the temperature dependence of the resistivity. So by doing here the, uh, the, the, the X-ray, we find out that at this temperature, this anomaly, there is a structural transition. The system goes from tetragonal to or thrombic. And the indication of superconductivity, you have to see the zero resistance at nine Kelvin. So that was very important. Now, what happens if I apply pressure in the system? If I apply pressure to the system, I in, enhance the TC from nine till two, uh, till 25, which is also very important for the community to see how the TC behaves with pressure and also with doping, what I'm going to show uh, now. So in doping, instead of pressure, I try to see, is it exactly doping will do the same with pressure? And what we can see here is that sulfur doping increase the uh, TC slightly a little bit. And this system is not BCS because BCS part in copper chauffeur, which is a specific heat jump shows like 1.43. And uh, by mapping out the phase diagram, you can see the different uh, coexistence between different order superconductivity and also structural transition and uh, so on. So uh, that was for uh, the one one system. And the last system, what I'm going to show is related to the 1111 compound, which shows the highest TC on uh, uh, this class of family. And by measuring the neodymium iron arsenic oxygen, and you can see here no superconductivity at all, what you see here is a magnetism. So and now we try to dog the system by fluorine, adding the fluorine to the oxygen side. What we have seen here, very nice metallic behavior. And you can see the drop here to zero. So that's, uh, that's indication for superconductivity. If I increase more the, the doping, so the TC up to 55. Kelvin. So that's a way how do we enhance the uh, super uh, conductivity on this class of materials. And uh, since we have a single crystal, you can measure also orientation because single crystal you have AB plane and CP plane and so on. That's important for applications and for uh, uh, an isotropy effect and so on. So for H parallel C, that's C plane, and also you rotate the sample 90 degree and measure the same, you get also different result between here and here. That confirms the high quality of your uh, materials. And now I, I, do, I start with doping already. What happens with pressure? So we already published also recently the work on uh, neodymium iron arsenic oxygen with pressure. What you can see here, interestingly, is that pressure suppresses superconductivity and induced such kind of magnetism. So we're still also working on this to understand what kind of magnetism we have it here. What's the link between superconductivity and magnetism? So there are a lot of open questions to be answered in, in this field in order to uh, uh, modify or order to say some kind of theory behind this high TC uh, superconductors. And as you can see, the work is also uh, collaborated from Dave Mao from China and also Masaki Niku from uh, in Japan. So recently also we tried to answer questions on transition metal dicalcognites, uh, tantalum sulfur too, that at ambient pressure here shows one Kelvin. And if you apply pressure, 
you enhance the transition with one order of magnitude, which was very important to enhance also uh, the uh, superconductivity in these uh, classical materials. And just two months ago, we answered also questions on the sister compound instead of a, a tantalum, a ubium system, and we were able to discover new phases in the superconducting state itself. So uh, uh, with this, there are still challenging in understanding uh, 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 quantum materials, which is a very important uh, topic nowadays, particularly on how to achieve the room temperature uh, superconductor and also how to get a high quality on these uh, materials. So what we do in a regular, uh, uh, in our lab in order to see these things, we start with materials and then we conduct our experiment. We ask uh, a theoretician to model our uh, system and then we look for applications and so on. So that is actually the, the, the circular way. And what we call this actually, we call it a research. And with this, we also, we can try to understand the material and to see how the electrons behaves in the material from the experimental point of view and also from theoretical point of view. And then we can see what the application point uh, uh, towards energy applications. So I summarize my talk just by uh, defining the quantum materials. These materials are uh, electrons do not behave like a free particles. So it's not like a classical one, but electrons behaves like and, and the electron electron interactions affect us in a prominent role. And uh, 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 we studied the electrons in quantum materials. We have seen how the electron behaves also in under extreme conditions. The examples are like magnetism and superconductivity, as we you can see it here from the uh, uh, from the figures, as well as also the challenging which we still face is how to <coughs> sorry how to get high quality material from that and also the uh, uh, applications, uh, what we are looking for in the coming futures. So uh, with this, I would like to thank my uh, uh, collaborators and the students, postdocs, and also my funding agency. And uh, also please uh, contact me if you have any questions, if you want to collaborate in such kind of material, if you want to measure something, if you can visit us for just to, uh, 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 to do some kind of measurement, uh, we are really open for collaborations. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Abdelhamid Al-Hassi, for the invitation. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Ali Al-Gayar, for this. And uh, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you for uh, your presentation and for your time and for being uh, with us today. And uh, I give the opportunity to the participant for any questions. Ah, Doctor. Uh, is there? Is there any cost solution to the uh, to apply the superconductors in the power generation? Mahmoud? Yes. This is the first question. Is there yet any cost solution to apply the superconductor in power generation? Uh, uh, then already we are figuring out what kind of materials and the base on the material itself. Uh, uh, what we are going to use. So, uh, so far we are looking now for the uh, uh, room temperature superconductors to really to lose the cost of this kind of uh, material. So the research is going on uh, on how to enhance uh, these kind of materials to be used in the room temperature uh, uh, range and so on. But so far there are some kind of applications, but they are really costed because they uh, based on liquid nitrogen and you have to cool the material and, uh, and uh, uh, that's cost of also money. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, the second part is the high pressure and low temperature are very costly. Is this a comment or? Uh, yeah, that, that's, it depends on the machine. So uh, high pressure is really costly because you are using diamond. And I use I use like each month like four diamonds and each each two diamonds like five thousand dollar. 
So it's really, uh, if you are uh, dealing with high pressure, you need a fund, you need a funding agency. So that's why thanks to Agia for this, for supporting our research and also uh, to the other agency and so on. So in principle, it's a low temperature and high pressure, it's a bit costly because you have to cool down the system using not nitrogen, but using helium, as well as also if you want to use like diamond and pressure cell, that also costs it money. But uh, if you have really a proposal and you want to collaborate with something, we can really think of uh, making something like this. Uh, thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you very much. And uh, because we are running out of time, and uh, I would like to uh, send my regards, warm regards to you, and uh, very Thanks, happy to be with us. Uh, and thank you for Dominic as well. <laughs> she will be with us since early morning. And Tawa Halian, Kamana, the keynote speaker, is then you and you come to Fadul Khaj and the Fadur. وبعدها حنبدو السيشنز الرئيسيات اللي هن حسب الجدول بتاع البروجرام اللي موجود عندك عندي خاص بالمؤتمر شكرا لكم على حضوركم وعلى اهتمامكم وان شاء الله يعني تستمتعوا بفعاليات